just like every picture tells a story, every ad tells a story. And uh, some of it is even spontaneous in the sense that, you know, you've got a certain uh, typeface and you've got a certain graphic design. And then you even have the space for the handwritten, yeah. you know, specifics of an event that, you know, maybe was subject to change at that point. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. So I see, I see and actually, so music look, coming up. Well, there. let me just point this out. So on the lower left here, I can actually almost see that. This is the uh, Boston Tea Party. Um, the... One was the 69, right? Yeah, May, and June. May of 1969. And, you know, I asked David specifically, I was like, I want you to give me some of th the things that are your favorites that you would want to see included. And that's one of the ones he gave me. One of the very few, which certainly means a lot. The, the, the... The spring, May with the Who. So this is the Boston Tea Party, the Led Zeppelin. This is just in two months, month one, and a half. Month. Yeah. yeah, really one month. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, go on. It's Velvet like Underground, yeah. Joe Cocker, Jeff Beck, the Who, Led Zeppelin, and, uh, you know, Allman Brothers opening for the Velvet Underground. And like I said, not only was the price, you know, a couple bucks, but, you know, the beauty was that this was a small venue that, you know, it was like 12, 1,300 people. And you could pick your position. You wanted to stand, you know, by the soundboard. You wanted to stand stage right, stage left. You know, you didn't need razor blades on your elbows to fight your way through a crowd. No, I know. I know. Uh, a couple of tickets are going to come up, but we we spoke about tickets last time. At this, you know, tickets go through ears. Their ears were like every ticket looked like a Ticketmaster ticket. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, but right. much earlier, um, were tickets something that people were saving? Uh, you're picking up up off the floor. How did tickets work? Were there a lot of guest lists? I mean. There are certainly shows I don't have tickets for. Because that's that's the, the sad thing sometimes about um, you know guest lists. How about like early though, like sixty? Well, shows the, we all hear about. The reason that there were tickets um, in that period is that they were selling them at different locations around the town. Uh, right. So you know, so-called head shops, you know, or hip clothing stores. They would sell tickets, yeah. and uh, you know, so there had to be a physical ticket. Yeah, there were guest lists, but usually if it was the media that, you know, instead of being on a guest list, a record company would buy the tickets from the venue and then hand deliver them to the person at the radio station or the uh, newspaper or gotcha. magazine. I've actually, I've never seen a Tea Party ticket. I mean, were they pretty boring or did they have like designs on them? Were they, because uh, that's the other thing too, like Chris is talking about. Yeah. Sometimes they're like this one. Uh, I have here for Wild Man Steve, the comedian who was a WILD DJ back in the 60s. Right. This is a Cortese, yeah. but visually this is not interesting at all. It's the, um, usually... Uh, it's important because of who it is, where it is, but... Certain acts, you know, like the Grateful Dead, would always kind of give an identity and a personality to their tickets. My fear when we come out of the uh, clampdown and the quarantine and performances start again is that everything is going to be mobile. Yeah. There's not going to be physical tickets anymore. Well, yeah. So like I have, here's a good, so I have this whole uh, several decks of just um, tickets. I, I'm kind of obsessed with tickets. Yeah. And I haven't even, the beauty of my journey so far is I haven't even touched David's tickets oh, yet. So we got, we got boxes and boxes so, so of tickets. We'll, we'll All right, let's, uh, let's, let's play some music. Let's, uh, let's get a quick in. Uh, a quick break, and uh, I think you know, we're on music, so uh, I don't know if you want to play Marley or, or quite a few uh, clips. And, and I guess it, since we are, you know, are doing the event, you must tell us about how like you know multimedia stuff comes in. Like you saw, you come across a ticket or an ad, and then you go and you know, find the clip. That's well, attached to I, it. I think the, the, the you know the idea of setting things up in a retrievable fashion is that uh, there. Uh, are you know connecting of the dots going on here that you can take a ticket from the isolated ticket category boxes and, and then you can go to find the ad and then you can go to find perhaps the autographed album of the act or you can find the dedicated box so if we're talking Marley for example so you know Brian has found great footage of a Bob Marley concert at the Harvard um, Stadium. Right. There it is. All right. So. Oh, wow. Look at this. Okay, then, so we're going to go. Yeah. This, this is from volume one of the book. Take it. Right. 
But uh, so here's the lineup, and here's the advertising of the, of the concert poster. But we could go find ads for this. We could go to the Marley Box and find, you know, promotional items that Island Records was putting out at that time. Amazing. Uh, and you know, there are promo photos, there are press kits. Uh, I think there's an autographed uh, photo of Marley in the box. Let's yeah. just read it, and I think you know it's it's visible. It's as good as it's going to get online, but. We got it's Patty Labelle, Eddie uh, Palmieri. Um, this is a Dick, hosted by Dick Gregory, Dick Gregory, who you will see in the video. Um, but I think that's one of my favorite parts about of this whole project, just that whole you know one thing leads to another. Well, yeah, and yeah. there's but there's all these. So like the beauty of this for this is a good example of the Amandala show. I mean, I have the program. I know the people who put it on. I mean, Rebe Garofalo was one of the main people. Uh, from UMass Boston, Professor Emeritus, who founded Mass Rock Against Racism, uh, and a lot of other, then founded Honk, if people know the Honk Festival. I mean, Rebe is no joke. He was part of the crew who put this on together. And then, so at first I kind of, I found it, I knew, I consistently learned more and more about things like this. So now I know the whole story. I know the whole story about the security out there, they demanded that there were no police that were the security at the festival. They provided their own and they had to train them for like a year in order to kind of do what they wanted to do. They did, it was a, a benefit for different uh, organizations in South Africa that were fighting apartheid at the time. Um, and so there's like so much stuff going on. I have five, four or five different posters. And so they had done all, I have a subway poster wow. that's more were those um, horizontal. Ones? Hmm? Where, where those mostly come from? Where were you able to? From actually from Reby, Reby oh, Adam, course, yeah. yeah. Um, so so there's like this incredible story behind everything, and then the one perhaps that I like the most is uh, I can't remember the guy's name. The guy who I believe owned uh, um, Lulu White's English dude. Uh, I forget what his name was. He Bob Marley had not committed to they had gotten some kind of a verbal agreement like a year before, but as of like a month before this concert, and he was the headliner and clearly a superstar who was gonna be the main draw, he had not signed the contracts. And they were like, this could be a problem if he doesn't show up and we are advertising that Bob Marley is playing and he doesn't show up, there's gonna be a problem. You're gonna have police then. Yes, then police will be, will be there. So uh, this gentleman went to Jamaica and uh, basically posted up outside of Bob Marley's compound wow. on Hope Road and waited for like three days for him to come out and said, hey, are you coming to Boston or what? And he's like, of course, of course. And he's like, can you please sign this contract? Sure. And it was like happened in five minutes, except it took, you know, a lot of, you know, Rolades and Tums and, 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 and uh, money and time to figure this out. So there's the... There's the, the, the surface of it is that this is a really amazing poster, but then the more you hear about it, then you kind of learn these Very stories. Nice and enough. I have this whole- For those who just tuned in, uh, what were you That was uh, Bob, Bob Marley, uh, kind of, even though he was not on last, kind of headlining the Amandala uh, concert at Harvard Stadium in July of 1979. I'm gonna find this from volume two. Because a lot of times I kind of continue things in a certain way. So that was a, the a important Bob Marley show uh, from 79. Uh, and for those who are just like tuning up, I'm putting the link so you can all, please tell that uh, that the can, oh yeah, uh, somebody's inquired about your can of tab. <laughs> That's yes, a, it is a, still available. A very, very important artifact uh, ultimately will be uh, a collector's <laughs> item because. Uh, no, not if you keep drinking them. <laughs> well, no. Oh, wait, are those <laughs> actually? Wait, are, He's uh, drinking it. Yeah, That's I not know, a problem. I they still, I they I'm, I'm, I'm still pouring the poison into my body <laughs> as, as long as they make it. But I think they're, I, as of March, I think they're uh, they're not going to be uh, manufacturing tab anymore. They also may be running out of room for Boston uh, <laughs> memorabilia. <because> they have <laughs> to uh, stock that. I, I, will, I will say that I am not redeeming the empty cans. That's for sure. <laughs> Amazing. So, uh, if, you know, that's David Beaver, by the way. We are at the David Beaver archives, everybody. Um, and uh, Adam, we're going to put some information about the archive. Uh, uh, I'll put it on the stream. <laughs> so check it out. I just have the, uh, them retreat into the... The deep, you know, the, the back of the archives 
before some of these actual publications. Wait, actually, I want to show this one more thing. That so this, oh, okay, is, okay. this is from volume two. So this this took me a while. So a lot of times I'd say with the, with the ads, people have kind of made requests. Oh, you know what you should do? You should get this or that. And like, I'm like, that's not the way it works. The ads find me. I do not find the ads because anytime I try and look for one, I can never, ever find it. This, I took me a while to kind of find it. And so these are the first, to my knowledge, the first two appearances of Bob Marley in Boston. Um, and I put them both on the same page here on the left. The first, well, they're both at Paul's Mall. Um, the first uh, is definitely the first time. Um, this was from July 1973, and it just first U.S. appearance, the Whalers, explosive Jamaican reggae sound. Um, and then two years later, June 1975, he was, it was already Bob Marley and the Whalers headlining, and then we kind of know what happened. And then on the right are actually two uh, hip-hop shows locally. Um, but anyways, let's talk more about, so that's... Well, we from, can talk about that, you know, I was at the Bob Marley Paul's Mall show. And where you at? The thing that was so stunning was that uh, uh, marijuana not being legal at the time, they could care less. So, and, well, like, well, you, we have you here, so let's get this on the record. Yeah. <laughs> we're, not in a dorm, it's not personal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but I want to, were shows smoke filled or were they not? Yes, in general, general, if yes. I was in a Doors show, like, well, yeah, like yeah. a Tea Party, oh, must have been. They were. They, so they, what? I mean, this was just a, that that exceptional that they can't. They gave well, that well it was exceptional that the act was was as blatant and flagrant in smoking on stage. Gotcha. And the saturation <laughs> emanating from the stage out to the audience provided the opportunity to get high. It wasn't, <laughs> you know, because it was um, the. the, the the smoking was more in the bigger venues. You know, Paul's Mall Jazz Workshop, they were subterranean, down and dirty clubs. On they were both downstairs. You had to go downstairs. You went down the stairs. To the left was the Paul's Mall. To the right was the Jazz Workshop. And they didn't have more than a, you know, a couple hundred people. Saying, so what are these, like 150 yeah, person? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and those are lounge size? Those um, are bigger. Middle bigger East up. Middle East, yeah. Okay. Middle East no, up. But not, I mean, the Middle East downstairs, much bigger because I think there the capacity is That's about like 600, 700. 450 or five yeah. legally. Anyhow, right. but uh, uh, this, you know, especially with Marley and the Whalers, this was their signature statement, the smoke. There was no question about that. <laughs> that was unbelievable. And, uh, you know, not, aside from the music and the fact that, you know, the record company Island was just then breaking the act. And so they had a lot of, you know, BCN people in uh, Boston, Phoenix, and, uh, you know, uh, came from, well, actually at that point it was the real paper and the Boston. Phoenix. Are you talking about the first show and they were just yeah. the, the 73 one? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, all right. So this is, I mean, it all kind of comes together, doesn't it? It does. So um, we, we talked, you know, last time there was a, a preliminary uh, edition of this uh, get together. And we, we talked a lot about uh, reggae's dominance in Boston, how uh, the harder they come played at um, Orson Welles. Well. Played at played the Orson Welles well cinema for, for years. years. Yeah. Um, As a matter of fact, there was one show, uh, I, I believe BCN DJ was Sam Copper. And we used to tape a lot of those shows. Yeah, yeah. And he had uh, his uh, mobile unit that was on a bus and he'd go from venue to venue and yeah. captured a lot of the shows. Jimmy Cliff was appearing in town. And The Harder They Come was still playing at the Orson Welles Cinema. And uh, Sam, you know, and then the audience would get stoned, they'd get high at these, you know, The Harder They Come screenings. And Sam, came from the concert, got up on stage at the Orson Welles, said, I have a surprise for you. People were there just to see the movie. He brought out from behind the screen, Jimmy Cliff. These are the things that people have trouble believing. <laughs> people could not believe. Well, that. look at it. So this is this is early. This is the Orson Welles ad from March 79. And so oh, it's really. still playing. Although yeah. this one is a midnight. The late shows are Sweet Movie at Triple X, Flesh Gordon, and the harder they come, yeah. Which I guess I imagine some people probably were oh, like, "Oh, the harder they come." That oh, sounds midnight. that yeah. sounds pretty sexy. Yeah, man. Right. I'm gonna check um, that out. So, and the reason for it, so you know, there's obviously then other reggae uh, shows, activity. Um, 
experiences, and this is we're talking here to talk about ads. How much of that is driven by, you know, um, these ads? Well, and, well, that was you know, that, that was the lifeblood of these alternative, you know, underground, whatever name you want to call them. I mean, same way that radio evolved from underground FM radio to AOR to progressive to alternative. I mean, there every handful of years there was a new terminology to describe what the format was. Jason Frame stayed... is my partner. He just he distinguishes. <laughs> and he does. I mean, you know, the Phoenix was on you know, not underground, it was alternative. Whereas Well it started of... out as underground. Started out no and, question. And I mean staple, I have right? I have issues that it wasn't even staple because there were only four pages. You know, it was like a, a front cover with news and uh, the uh, pages two and three were interspersed with ads and listings, and there was another, you know, back page maybe once again ads. There's and a Phoenix for you folks right there. Yeah, it was so, at, uh, that's from that's early November '69. Yeah, oh, and you wow. could look, you could see that the price, you know, this went up fifteen cents. Fifteen <laughs> cents, and that money was split between. The people who were standing in the street, the hawkers, yeah. who were selling the papers, and uh, the publisher. And if we're talking about ads, we have to talk about how, like, that's like the centerpiece of you know the breakups of, of you know people leaving papers, people starting their own papers. That you sold out. No, you sold out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, no. ads I mean, revenue. I mean, that's that's well, and that's what happened, happened in '72 when Stephen Mindich, who was the owner and the publisher, there he is. Uh, uh, yeah of uh, Boston After Dark brought out the Cambridge Phoenix. And the Cambridge Phoenix staff said, you can buy the receivables for advertising dollars, you can buy the name and the logo type, but you can't buy us. And within a week or two, they created the real paper, uh, which uh, was, you know, for the next 10 years, you know, a thorn in the side and a competitor of the Boston Phoenix. And of course, for those who uh, may not be aware, there is a film um, that is purportedly, you know, lo very loosely based on the that war. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's interesting, though, to point out, too, that, you know, how uh, these grew into, you know, just you, you kind of walk sideways carrying an issue because they were so heavy. <laughs> Look, Jim, this, hold that up, hold up. This, up. The, the the slash on, <laughs> on on the front page says that's the whole thing. Yeah. Four hundred and forty eight <laughs> pages. Our biggest issue. Four hundred and forty eight pages. And this was when is it? And and it was actually on the newsstands for a dollar fifty. You know, so obviously ten times the cost of what it is. I have to do the math. That may be more pages than every day of the entire. Year. <laughs> um, and this was as recently as November of uh, nineteen ninety nine. So. It's you know, 21 years ago, healthy, thriving, surviving. I mean, could you hold it? Yeah, hold it to the side so they can see that side. That's yeah, it's like <laughs> it's a sandwich, like everybody. Section after section, arts and entertainment, a supplement on <laughs> Scholars Jazz Club. Oh, I love like you get, you'll get like these advertising <laughs> inserts, like the computer. Yeah, well, well, there, oh, there it is. Yep. The internet. Oh man, <laughs> so that, that is crazy. That is something we've all been missing: shopping. You know, like, and that's not enough. In November, you got a section on outdoors, <laughs> so I would take it as from skiing. I assume, you know, but you know, city life. Uh, you know, an insert from Strawberries Records is gone. Yeah, you know, romance. You know, a whole romance <laughs> insert, an adult section, so to speak. Eight days a week. I would bet there's more than one adult section. Unbelievable. Um, I mean, this, this, there, there were, there were. More sections in this paper than there were pages in the early. So issues. I think this this actually this this kind of begs the question, Brian. Yeah. Where do you start and stop? I mean, it's kind of interesting. You know, um, you have a actually, uh, David. What was a healthy advertising to content ratio? I mean, 50 fifty. You're like 50, back, fifty, even sixty forty. You prefer to have sixty advertising to forty. Yeah, but but in something like this. So much. <laughs> well, what is that? Well, here's the reason I see. Here's the reason I bring it up because some people will look at something like this, and maybe you're just looking for the music stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. That's like twenty percent of this. Yeah. So you're, if you're doing sixty four, let's say it's fifty percent, Brian, fifty percent of this is relevant to you. Yeah. Whereas you know somebody's just looking for like prison coverage or something. Yeah. They're looking for something specific. So how do you 
you know, what, well, are you just scanning a million things? Like, what, how Yeah, do you I scan. I mean, there's so many different, ver like I was saying before, the ads kind of find me. Like, I just expose myself so, to... So, so you're digging, you're looking for specific stuff. Or I am, stuff. but, but I'm like, I don't have the luxury of, for instance, saying, like, just literally three days ago, I was in those stacks in that other room over here because I, I really wanted to find uh, December, late November or early December 1983 Phoenix because uh, there was a Wild Style uh, hip hop, classic hip hop film called Wild Style that I recently, I always thought it only showed at the Coolidge Corner and I was made aware that it also was at the Orson Welles and I've never seen an ad. So I was looking for like an hour and of course I came up with, with nothing. And so anytime I need to find something, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So I've kind of just let the ads kind of flow and I just, yeah, I scan, I'll take uh, even that one that David's got with the 7,000 pages, I would look at it <laughs> and I would just kind of scan it and see almost like throwing a lure in the, in the water, like if you're fishing and just seeing what kind of bites, what jumps out at me, either something that I recognize, something that is visually interesting, something that seems important and maybe I need to explore it a little bit more. And my thing is more like scan now, worry about it later because it's in front of me and so why not? So you hear that folks, scan now, worry <laughs> later. Um, well, because because I have, I mean, this folder. Oh, by the way, everybody's looking at broadside because that's what the, the shot is you and the, the cover. So can you just help? You know, because I, I wanted to, I kind of dropped the ball and bring up the different publications. Well, this is so we're what this is this is kind of chronological. So this isn't the first by any stretch of the imagination, uh, kind of in the arts countercultural publications, but it was still a very important one. Um, this is volume two, so I think it must have started in 63. David, you want to talk a little bit about I mean, And actually, I'm looking right now. I can see a stack of probably about 60 broadsides right over there in the yeah. corner. <laughs> well, bro broadside, you know, once again, you know, in terms of uh, connecting the dots of the community and uh, the arts and the media, and uh, broadside kind of represented that period in Boston and Cambridge when this was kind of the folk epicenter of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, you had Joan Baez playing uh, Club 47 and Bob Dylan, you know, up and comer and uh, so many uh, uh, acts that later, you know, either signed or were already signed to Vanguard or Elector Records, you know, the preeminent or uh, uh, folk labels. and. Uh, um, it's curious to think now that uh, all these decades later, uh, Club Passim, right outside of Harvard Square, it still exists as the location where uh, uh, Club 47 was. But this was a, a kind of a, a publication that was uh, chronicling the life and times of the folk performers who were both in Boston and Cambridge, but, you know, fanning out across the world. Um, and originally, I mean, it was it, it, at some point, was it before this or more later on when it was they printed or was it a separate edition where they printed lyrics and music to a lot of songs like that was part of what broadside did as well because as you'll see in the ads in any given broadside there are tons for uh buying a guitar um taking lessons if you want to promote there's one uh, ad i remember that's like if you want to promote your own concert like we can help you if you want to set something up at a coffee house, which obviously lots of people did. Dave Wilson, the uh, publisher, right. put on a lot of his own shows yeah. that were advertised in there. Shout out to Al Giordano, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, there was, there was also a magazine out of New York called Sing Out that had lyrics yep. as well. Yep. But uh, like lyrics, of stuff, like just contemporary song lyrics. Well, like yeah. folk stuff. Like well, if you well, wanted to learn you know, an Odetta was, song you know, or something. Lyrics, yeah. you know, no charge, just kind of. This yeah. is what you get when you buy the publication. When you mentioned, you know, Dave Wilson too, that not only was he involved with publications, but uh, he was also a record distributor. And he had uh, he had these small labels that he helped shepherd not only the promotional uh, attention to the media, but also to get in stores. He had these little labels, uh, some of which were folk labels, some of which were just kind of oddball, you know, I, I remember when I was a music director at WBUR, which 
back in the 70s actually played music. And, you know, I'd go there on a Friday just to pick up the new releases. And he had things, you know, international artists out of Texas. And, you know, the, you know at that point, you know, that was uh, uh, Rocky Erickson's label. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of fascinating to, to see how things were and people who were, you know, kind of almost like octopuses. They had multiple hands and multiple ventures and they all kind of interconnected. Well, but every, but the audience and the people putting out the magazines in the same way that uh, like a punk zine or this next slide is New England teen scene, which was the opposite side of it, which was more the, the coming rock and roll psychedelic. But at this point, the earlier ones were more kind of the garage scene or kind of Beatles sound alikes and things like that. Um, the audience and the, the people kind of like, that's what a lot of people said about the tea party concerts were that the audience and the musicians, you couldn't really tell who was who if you were just wandering through, you know, the back of the arena. And that's what the point was too, that the media people were also of that same age. Exactly. And so it was the audience, the performers and the media all one hand washed to the other. And it was like the Beatles lyrics of uh, I am you and you are me and we are all together because you were rooting for each other. But I think broadside's important. I mean, a lot of yeah. people know it, but it is important to, that it was a, one of the earliest. I'm holding a hit, hit parade. So we, we, of course, know Hit Parader. Yes. Not that that's not Hit Parade is very different than was, Hit Parader. Well, it's, well, it's, it's interesting because it's a... It's a it's been used a lot. I mean, there's a, I have I have hit parades, which is not this, which are just song lyrics. I think from yeah, like exactly. 50s, yeah. maybe 40. No, was, it was 50s, that's true. 60s, yep. Yeah, so that's 70s. not what this is. What is this? this that is was called parade. the Hit Parade of Boston. Yeah, yeah. that was a, a gay publication, right. generally gay publication. What, what, you 78, 79, right? Yeah. yeah you yeah, holding yeah. anything else over there? Well, I think that that's important in the sense that you know, at that point, I was at WBCN. And, um, you know, I was kind of in charge of media, creative services and advertising, both, you know, what was going on at the station, but externally as well. And I advertised in that because, you know, I thought that, you know, BCN in its universality of programming, that we could support these small publications. You know, What's New magazine, yep. uh, the hit, hit, you know, I hit, parade, hit Parade was uh, the beat. You know, there were so many. This is gorgeous too, by but, the way. It's like big and it's and that, and white, Well, that's the thing why, I, the reason I love it, it, it wasn't made, uh, it was made for full page. Wow. Actually, that ad on the right there is in volume two for Herbie's Ramrod Room. Look at that. Um, and actually, for me, from a scanning perspective, it makes my life a lot more difficult because that will not fit on my scanner. <laughs> that being said, uh, Hit Parade of Boston was an incredible, uh, the photography in there was amazing. The ads were amazing for uh, venues that wouldn't advertise, certainly in the Globe or the Herald. Certainly not a full page ad for Chaps. You're not going to find that even in the Phoenix, probably. So, and of course, I think we have a, a tribute in, in order, too. Mm, we got Stuff a, magazine. We have stuff here. Right. Um, Robert, tells a little about the history. And, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the uh, creative force behind Stuff magazine, Robert Birnbaum, just passed away. So uh, it's kind of a bittersweet to look at that publication. But he basically, that, that was created by uh, a person who's still around, Don Levy. Uh, who has been a serial entrepreneur. He had a goods department store in Harvard Square. and uh, uh, He started this magazine as really just an advertising... Really ahead of its time. It, it really is. It, yeah. like, it was well, actually, I mean, stuff in, in the Hip Parade of Boston looked actually pretty similar in at, the way at that, that they... Point, stuff's yeah. even bigger just for everybody. But is it? Anybody geeking out at home over the actual <laughs> format of this stuff? And, <laughs> but, but that's stuff, important because you created to be only a full page ad that yeah. you could buy as an artist or as a photographer, as a designer, to show your talent. And it cost, I think, $125 a And there day. were others like that. That was a, that was a thing, right? Not yeah. common, but it existed. Right? But it was, it, so Don Levy used it, he had full page ads for his enterprises as well. Robert Birnbaum came along and added a total content mm. to it. And he uh, was a very esteemed photographer. He did a lot of great author interviews. He did uh, 
party pics, you know, people, he, he solicited photographs from the audience. You could, you know, yeah. your constituency could send in, you know, anything that they thought was interesting. And it was really a, a, a forum for creativity. And but that's uh, that's when publications are at their strongest, whether it's the noise or stuff or broadside, when the audience feels like they're participants. Yeah, they're not right. just being it's a two way street. And actually, if you look at the back of that, that's a BCN ad, right? Yeah. So I assume you were the one yeah. placed that. I, yeah. I have like a really like kind of silly question on this, although maybe not. Um, do you do you sometimes find yourself holding something that it's like it's got a million dates but not a year on it? Yes. Yeah. Well, that, it yeah, happens to me quite a bit. Usually that's with the flyer, but then what do you, <laughs> usually what you do is go to the masthead and see if they've copywritten uh, uh, the yeah. year. Because yep. a, a lot of times, you know, they didn't even know how long they were going to be yep. on the newsstands. They didn't want to be locked into a year. Yep. I totally get it. Yep. I just, it just kind of dawned on me because I, I don't see a lot of years. A lot yeah. of times that's usually a, a, a flyer issue oh, more, <laughs> more than oh, a publication definitely. issue. Well, and that's interesting because a lot of times you can tell bootleg or counterfeit flyers and posters because they will actually, uh, if they're manufacturing it later on, they'll add the year so that it's anchored in time. Whereas if you're given a poster or a flyer for something that's happening in 2020, which nothing was happening, but assuming it did, you would know what year you're in. Yeah. You don't need that, you know, yeah. that space to well, be Well, sometimes active. it really depends. I think it depends on the how kind of I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but how much more of a, a how much attention to detail you have? Because I definitely have flyers that are for very small events that were not something that they n thought they were going to ever do another one, and it has the the year on it. Yeah. But well, generally, you're like right. Small. I mean, here's the thing: are people thinking this stuff? I mean, this is pretty. Uh... I mean, with Tea Party or some kind of Fillmore East, I bet. I mean, we're well, in the neighborhood Beaver archives. We don't ask what your favorite thing is. You don't ask how much you want to sell things for because nothing's for sale. And I, you know, but we, uh, you know, certainly I. I